Rivers spend their last days in murky waters. Their last stretches are turbid and slow and head inexorably towards the end. But it's precisely here, where its life ends, that the river's banks and water turn into one of the richest environments on the planet. Estuaries have the capacity to provide food for billions of living beings. Fish, birds and crustaceans are constantly moving in and out of the estuary's dominions. There are various reasons for this abundance. One reason is that this mix of fresh and salty water creates an attractive and ever-changing cocktail at the mouth of the river. Another key reason is that when the mighty river reaches the sea, its water carries thousands of tons of suspended matter. This is its final legacy, a rich food that is deposited on its banks and gradually dilutes as it penetrates into the sea. This enormous volume of floating matter is the base of the estuary's food chain. The tide's rhythmic presence, which transforms the entire landscape every six hours, is also in great part responsible for attracting such diverse life forms. The smallest creatures are the most abundant and the first to take advantage of each opportunity offered on the mouth of the river. The microscopic organisms that live in the mud, sands and waters are the very first link in the estuary's incredibly long food chain. These countless beings include worms, crustaceans, microscopic clams, and an amazingly wide variety of strange characters. Many are no bigger than the grains of sand on the beaches surrounding the estuary. These microfauna have enormous capacity to reproduce themselves and occupy every millimeter of the ecosystem, turning it into a sort of broth of life. Most of these creatures find food in the detritus dragged over by the river and the tides.
An ecosystem such an enormous quantity of food can satisfy the needs of many different beings. The filtering organisms live immersed in the estuary's mud, where they concentrate by the millions. This is true of mollusks such as clams, mussels, cockles, and curved razor shells. During high tide, they take out their siphons and use them to suck in the particles that float by. They don't usually move very far, but they can be very agile thanks to the muscular foot they use to bury themselves. The mollusk's activity level is determined by the changing tides, but they're not the only ones who depend on the water's toing and froing. Different animals are active depending on whether the tide is high or low. As if by magic, when the water level diminishes, the mud is filled with the most varied beings. Some animals live immersed in the sludge, and their bodies are perfectly adapted to this soft and doughy medium. The fiddler crab is one such good example. At the first sign of danger, fiddler crabs hide in the dens they dig in the mud, and they come out from the mud to eat whenever they can. Many crabs have evolved and adapted in order to live in the estuary's fine sediments. Their pendulating eyes peep out like tiny periscopes to scan the horizon, while their bodies stay buried in the mud. They also have large spoon-shaped claws that they use to grab food from the surface. The waning tide does more than just remind the estuary's many guests of their meal times. When the sea pulls back, there is plenty of fresh river water, which makes this a good time to clean one's feathers. Many birds lie in waiting in the estuary's floodplains and surrounding salt marshes. The birds here do not compete with each other. Seagulls prowl about, lurking in every corner. They are great opportunists who feed off offal and all sorts of small animals. Their companions, the egrets, are exclusively carnivorous, 
and base their diet almost entirely on the little crabs and fishes that are trapped in the wetlands during low tide. They know that they must take full advantage of the low water to fill their stomachs, and they dutifully do just that. Once the water level rises, these little animals will be free again, and it will be impossible to catch them. In the area near the mouth of the river, the sea rises during high tide, flooding most of the surrounding plains. This creates the salt marshes and tidal reaches that attract birds capable of wading comfortably in the water. Such is the case of the roseate spoonbill that frequently visits estuaries and their surrounding wetlands. Spoonbills take advantage of the huge quantity of invertebrates who live in the mud. They sweep the muddy floor, opening and closing their beaks until they find a tasty treat, which they'll then eat without ever seeing it. There is so much food that snails can sometimes gather in groups of over a million per square meter. They feed off microscopic algae and the detritus in the mud. Their success is due to their ability to withstand the constantly changing tides and the fluctuations in the water's salinity. Along with bivalves and small crustaceans, snails are in turn a favorite dish for some frequent visitors to the estuary. Water birds arrive in waves during the harsh winter months that freeze other latitudes. It's migrating season, 
And here they find a warm, generous, and hospitable source of water waiting. Multitudinous groups of waiters thoroughly search the estuaries, salt marshes, and the coast for food. How can such a large number of animals possibly live together so peacefully? How do they share the pie so as not to constantly compete for the same morsels? The answer is in how their bodies are designed. Just take a moment to carefully observe their legs and beaks. Each waiter frequents a very different area of the estuary depending on the length and shape of its beak or the length of its legs. Waders with short beaks tend to hunt more actively, first sighting their prey and then quickly hunting them down. However, Birds with longer beaks use them as a drill that they stick in the estuary's mud, and they find their victims using sensors at the ends of their beaks. In addition, their long legs allow them to wade into areas with deeper water. The rising tide marks the next shift in the large restaurant that is the estuary. Now it's turn for the aquatic animals. The estuary's turbid waters are the sturgeon's domain. These primitive fish's life in the wild still holds many secrets. Sturgeons prospect the estuary's darkest and most shadowy territories, capturing all sorts of animals. Their lives are very eventful. Throughout their more than 100 years of life, they don't just live in the turbid waters where the river and sea mix. In time, during the breeding season, the sturgeon will follow the river upstream. Their goal is the clean and sandy riverbeds close to the source. Sturgeons are solitary animals, but now they'll look for a mate to fertilize their eggs. The females can lay up to six million eggs, 
that will stay stuck to the riverbed. In little over a week, the eggs will grow to form tiny little sturgeons. The young sturgeons will slowly swim downstream until they reach the estuary. It'll be a year before they even dare cross the river's limit and penetrate the dark and prolific life of its mouth. Estuaries are areas that communicate two very different mediums, the river's fresh water and the salt water of the sea. There is often a difference in the salt content between the area behind the river and the open sea. Many beings are not capable of surviving this change in salinity. However, in the estuary and its surroundings, there are several species that move from one type of water to the other without a problem, or can at least tolerate a certain change in salinity. Such is the case of certain special fish, such as the Iberian tooth carp or the three-spined stickleback, who often live under the estuary's fluctuating influence. The water farther removed from the coast is also enormously rich. In many areas of the estuary, there is a huge concentration of plankton that makes the most of the nutrients the continent provides. The plankton, in turn, attract enormous schools of tiny little fish that are the continuation of an extensive and striking food pyramid that includes large fish, mammals, and birds. The estuary's productivity, that is to say, their capacity to generate organic matter, is comparable to the productivity of the tropical forests or the coral reefs. The estuary's wealth generously expands from the river's mouths throughout the sea. That is where the alliance between fresh and salt water gives shape to one of the planet's most diverse ecosystems.